The doctrine of the Holy Trinity is one of those things that you cover in first year systematic theology. You study the nature of the three persons of the Holy Trinity, the, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And at first glance, it seems rather straightforward and rather simple. The Father, the Creator, the Son, Jesus Christ, the Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit. But you can kind of get this visual encapsulation of the Father. It's often depicted by people today as this guy, old guy with a great big long beard sitting up on the throne somewhere. Well, nah, that's not really God the Father, but that's how some people seem to think of God the Father. Then, of course, there's Jesus Christ. We've all seen pictures of Christ well, in his life here on earth with the beard and working miracles. But the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, is the hardest to get your hands around. Coming to a conceptualization of the nature of the Holy Spirit is kind of like nailing jello to the wall. It just kind of won't stick doesn't stay. In fact, used to be we called him the Holy Ghost, and that was really troublesome. When I was a kid, I, what brought to mind there was Casper the Friendly Ghost. Mm. The doctrine of the Holy Trinity can be hard to conceptualize. By the time I started learning about the Trinity when I was a kid, I had just learned that one plus one plus one equal what? Three. And then they started telling me that that was also one, huh? And then, of course, a couple of years later, I learned that one times one times one is one. one. Yes, a somewhat better way of illustrating mathematically the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. Of the three persons of the Trinity, the one who is the hardest to conceive of is the Holy Spirit. The one who is the hardest to come to grips with is the Holy Spirit. And yet, that is an amazing affirmation because if you think about it, the Holy Spirit is the one who is the closest to us. The Holy Spirit is the one who comes and remains and abides with us, guides us, directs us, lives with us and within us. The Holy Spirit is the one who communicates Christ Jesus' presence to us, who comes to live and to transform us, who comes to be with us eternally. So the one who is the closest to us, metaphysically, is also the one that we have the hardest time talking about. We see that here in today's lesson from the Gospel of St. John. We have in one sentence here all three persons of the Trinity talked about. And I will, Jesus speaking, I will ask the Father, and he, the Father, will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth. In one sentence, in the original, in one sentence, you have all three persons of the Holy Trinity. You have Jesus speaking. You have the Father spoken about. I will pray the Father. And the Father sends the other advocate, the Spirit of Truth. All three persons of this Trinity, although not labeled as such, are mentioned here or are present here. Notice what it says. Notice what Jesus says about this advocate. It's a weird term. The, the Greek word is parakletos. Parakletos. When, when I first heard that word, I thought they said the parakeet. No, it's the parakletos of God. And it comes from the Greek word parakaleo, which means cry for help, call for assistance, ask for guidance, plead for favor. It is the act of asking or begging for guidance, for favor, for assistance. It is the act of asking for help. Perakaleo means, help me. Perakaleo, help me please. Assist me, guide me, comfort me, strengthen me, direct me. Perakaleo means all of those things. And from that verb, 
comes the word, the noun, parakletos, one who helps, one who guides, one who gives direction and comfort, one who advocates. The, the word was used in legal parlance in the Greek world to stand for one who stood beside someone else before the magistrate or before the king. And when the person who was accused stood before the magistrate or the king, they weren't allowed to speak and they weren't allowed to leave to go get people to speak for them. So the perikletos job was to go and get people to advocate for them, to go to get witnesses to speak in their defense and to speak to the magistrate for the accused. So in the legal parlance, the, the Parakletos is the one who stands to advocate for the other. All of these ideas, all of these concepts are present here in speaking about the Holy Spirit. What else does Jesus say? I will ask the Father, and the Father will give you another Parakletos, another advocate, another comforter, another guide, another favor giver, to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth, the pneuma aletheia, the pneuma aletheia. That's a feminine concept or word complex, whom the universe, the cosmos, not just the world, all of creation, whom the universe cannot receive because the universe neither sees her nor knows her. You know her because she abides with you and will be in you. The pronoun used there, the pronoun I'm using here is her and she. In Greek, Nouns have gender, and so do pronouns. And the pronouns almost always mirror the noun's gender. Hence, in this case, when Jesus talks about the parakletos, the pronoun usage is masculine. But when Jesus suddenly switches to the pneuma aletheia, Jesus is switching to a feminine concept. Hence, the pronouns should follow suit. From Parakletos, he, to Numa Aletheia, her. The Parakletos acts to guide and comfort and direct and defend and protect. The spirit of truth, the Numa Aletheia aspect of the Holy Spirit, of the Parakletos, comes to reveal truth, meaning, life comes to reveal in ways that the cosmos, the universe, this created order cannot see or comprehend. The parakletos, the comforter, comes to provide many ways, many aspects, many understandings of comfort, of guidance, of favor. And Jesus says, she will be with us forever and within us. Notice what Jesus says. He, actually she, abides with you and she will be in you. Notice the verb tenses there. Because she abides, present tense, with you and she will be in you. The Numa Aletheia, the Holy Spirit, is within us. This is from the past tense, speaking to today, looking forward, will be in us. She was abiding with the people, had abided throughout the entire Old Testament. The Holy Spirit would come to descend upon the prophets and they would speak for God and then the Holy Spirit would leave. Or the Holy Spirit would come and descend upon the king and the king would speak for the Holy Spirit or for God and then the Holy Spirit would leave and the king would be left. The Holy Spirit would come and go, would go like the wind, and you know not which direction the wind goes throughout the Old Testament. Here, Jesus is proclaiming a change. 
you know this Holy Spirit because she has abided with you. But now she's going to be in you. She's going to dwell within your being. She's going to be present in your every fiber of existence. She's going to be present to transform, present to guide, present to lead, present to comfort, present to make us the hands and the feet and the eyes and the ears and the lips of Jesus. You ask, where did I get that from? I get it from right here. I will not leave you orphaned, Jesus says. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. So Jesus, who is in the Father, is also in us. And we are in him. They who have my commandments, this is my commandment that you love one another. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father. And I will love them and reveal myself to them. When we are in Christ, We have the love of God poured out into our living, into our very fibers of existence by the presence of the pneuma aletheia, the the spirit of truth. And this presence is typified by love. The word here is the high word in Greek for love, agape. It means the love that loves by a cause of the nature of the lover. It means a love that considers the needs of the other as more important than or essential to your own needs. It is the love that comes from God, is a gift from God, and returns to God and to others. It is the high form of love, agape is. And that is what we are called to have, infusing our being by the parakletos' presence in our lives. Listen to what he says here at the very end again. I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. Love. St. Augustine spoke about love as the medium within which the Holy Trinity functioned. The Father and the Son's love for each other and love for us is the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is the love of God. The Holy Spirit, the love of God, knits us in to this family of the Father and the Son, of the the eternal divine parent and the Redeemer, who is our brother. We become adopted. We're no longer orphaned. We become adopted into this divine family and knitted together as the family of God. And that love will not let us go. We may turn away. We may run away. We may try to deny the love of God. We may try to deny the presence of Jesus. We may say, no, I don't want to have anything to do with you. We may turn around and walk away from God. But God never stops loving us. That's the essence and the meaning of the presence, life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus. That Christ was in God reconciling the world to himself, and that Christ Jesus died for the sins of all while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Regardless of what we do, where we may go, God does not stop loving us. That bond of love, which is the very nature and essence of the third person of the Holy Trinity, that bond of love that is the very nature and essence of the pneuma aletheia, 
of the spirit of truth. That bond of love which empowers the parakletos' ability to stand for us, intercede for us, guide us, direct us, transform us. The bond of love is never broken, even by our sin. God's grace is always sure. We may turn and go away. And you know what we do? We turn and go away. We turn our back on God. We turn our back on the calling. When we deny the need of another, when we deny loving another, when we walk away from the presence of Christ, we try to break the bond of love. But we can't. God's grace is more powerful than our sin. God will never stop loving us. We may try to leave, but God won't let us go. Oh yeah, sure, in the end we can deny God and come to the point where we come to the end of our lives and step out into nothingness. Denying God. But up to that instant, God's love will always bind us close. One of the wonderful gifts of this family of faith is the love of God that infuses your every fiber of being, that calls you to welcome all, that calls you to welcome all into the family of faith, regardless of age or background, regardless of ethnicity or language, regardless of sexual orientation, design or nature. God's love calls us all, has called you as the family of faith to welcome all to hear and receive the gospel of Jesus Christ and to come in and be a part of the family of faith. You welcome all. You typify the pneuma aletheia. You typify the parakletos. You typify the presence of the Holy Spirit, that bond of love. And you proclaim it to all. In that way, this is kind of like a Pentecostal church. You live the life of Pentecost, the presence of the Holy Spirit. You live the life of God's love and share it with all. That is a wonderful gift this congregation has. It is my prayer for you in the coming years that you will continue to be an expression of the pneuma aletheia, the love of God, the spirit of truth, the parakletos, that you will continue to share the love of the real presence of Jesus with all and be open to all who come to you. My prayer for you, my sincere prayer, is that as you have welcomed, you will continue to welcome. As you have loved, you will continue to love. As you have guided many, you will continue to guide many. As you have comforted many, you will continue to comfort many. I speak as one who has been comforted by you. I came here one month after my father's death. My dad died on May the 11th, 2007. I came to be your pastor on June the 15th, 2007. It was a time of disaster for my family. It was a time of great depression for my mother. It was a time of depression for myself. I went from day to day and week to week, not even really knowing what was going on, sometimes at all around me. I felt lost in a fugue at times. I look back over the four years and I don't remember much. I listen to the sermons I preached those first several weeks here. I don't remember preaching them. But you comforted me. 
you welcomed me in as the Numa Aletheia, the love of God, the comforter, the guide, the advocate. You welcomed me in and you welcomed my mother in as you have welcomed so many and you have blessed me, my mother, and so many. I wanted to thank you for that, for being the Holy Spirit, the presence of Jesus Christ, the hands and the feet, the eyes and the ears and lips of Jesus to me. My prayer for you is that you will do this and keep doing it for all. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. been listening to a sermon by Dr. Gregory Neal, Senior Pastor of St. Stephen United Methodist Church and Rector of Grace Incarnate Ministries. Copyright 2011 by Dr. Gregory S. Neal. All rights reserved.